Hey everybody, welcome to another well cast. My name is Howard Jacobson. I'm the chief of behavioral science at Well Start Health. I am the host of the Plant Yourself podcast. What else? And I write books. I'm the co-author of Sick to Fit with Josh Lajani. Today I want to talk about the secret of Well Start Health. Why we're different from everything else out there. And there's a bunch of things that we've tried to do differently. And one of them is our coaches uh, are not, you know, just regular people who have gone through a coach training program. They've all gone through a coach training program, but they all come to this with a, you know, been there, done that resume. They've all experienced dramatic health transformations whether it's losing hundreds of pounds like Josh, whether it's recovering from hip surgeries and addictions and going on to be a, an Olympic contender like Sarah, whether it's like our chief medical officer, Dr. Sarai Stancic, who was on a walker um, canes because of her multiple sclerosis and has been symptom and medication free for 19 years, or whether it's people like me who were just sort of middle-aged before their time, chubby, lethargic, uh, high cholesterol, and then discovered a different way to do it. So one of the reasons that's so useful is that um, we can call out BS when we hear it in our participants because we recognize it in ourselves. And of course, we do it in a kind, gentle way, non-confrontational, non-shaming, but we don't let people get away with stuff because they're not fooling anybody. They're not they're not fooling us because we have been down in that pit. Second thing um, is that we are not a knowledge based program. We are not going to spend a ton of time teaching you what to do, what to eat, what vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients you get into your diet. Uh, specific exercises or walking or running protocols. That stuff is available everywhere. We are a behaviorally based program, which means the hard part is not knowing what to do, even if you didn't know what to do, even if you were totally confused about what to do, you probably know enough to move in the right direction. Even if you're, you know, keto, paleo, you're still going to cut out Fruit Loops and, and candy canes and Krispy Kreme donuts, right? You're still going to be moving in a positive direction, even if your knowledge is flawed, as long as you're moving. So we are a behaviorally based program, which means we really focus on how do you take action? How do you maintain action? How do you recover from bumps in the road? Which brings me to the third way we're, we're different for most programs is that we are a community based program. Um, we believe that community of people like minded people supporting each other is the growth medium for change. Think of it like, you know, yeah, you could start up a business in your garage all by yourself, but to be part of a co working space or have an incubator where there's people around you have who share your energy, who share your vision, your optimism, who can connect you with people that you need to be connected with, whether you need to figure out, you know, financing or governance structure or initial market tests, just to have a community of people who are up to the same thing is the difference. That's why people want to go to Silicon Valley. To for their startup and not Boise, Idaho, right? It's why there's hotbeds of excellence, why the Dominican Republic produces is, crazy number of baseball players for the um, national, you know, for the American and National League for Major League Baseball. Uh, it's why certain music schools produce all these incredible string players, right? There's there's incubator hubs. And so we see our community as an incubator hub for a new way to live, a way to be healthy and, and authentic in our humanness. But none of that's what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about today is and I'm, I'm just going to come out and say it, vitamin D. And what I mean by vitamin D, 
We used to call it vitamin P, and I'll explain why uh, I don't in a, just a little bit. But first of all, I know there is a vitamin D, and that's not the one that I'm talking about, because in fact, it's not a vitamin, right? A vitamin by definition is a thing that you cannot produce inside your body, so you must take it in from the outside. Well, D, what we call vitamin D is actually a hormone that is produced by the body on the skin in response to contact with sunlight. So that's not a vitamin. Vitamin D, what you see in the store on the label is a hormone. It's not a vitamin. We should never have called it D. So that leaves a wide open gaping space for my vitamin D, which is drum roll, please. Vitamin D discomfort. If you can hear me, uh, be cool to type a comment in just so I know I'm not just flapping my lips um, and I will continue talking about vitamin D discomfort. Being willing to be uncomfortable is the ultimate key to changing our behaviors around most things around lots of things, but specifically around food, around movement or as people sometimes know it as exercise. Vitamin D, the willingness to be uncomfortable is the key to changing behavior. I was chatting with uh, my buddy Peter Bregman a couple of weeks ago, and he was pointing out that like almost everything we do that we um, are trying not to do. Like if you want to do something, you can't do it. Like, let's say, you know, I want to juggle five tennis balls or something like. OK, it's a thing I can't do. And there's a way for me maybe to get there, but it involves a lot of work and practice and failure and feedback and all that. But let's say what I want to do is not punch my microphone. <laughs> I already have the ability to not punch my microphone. And if I just I'm, I'm so angry at something that I just can't I can't stop myself from punching my microphone. Well, then I'm struggling with something that is entirely based on a feeling state. There's nothing to do with skill, nothing to do with my ability to do the thing. Right. How do I know this? Because a dead person is better than me at not punching the microphone, a sleeping person, a person in a coma. They're all better at this thing than I am. So we know that if I if if I, all I have to do is do nothing, then what's stopping me? What's making it hard for me to resist punching the microphone? What's making it hard for me more to the point to resist eating the food, the, the donut in the break room? What's what's so hard for me to not order the cheesecake at the end of the company lunch at the Cheesecake Factory? Those are all things that a dead person could do easily. <laughs> it's not like dead people don't, you know, don't juggle five tennis balls, but they can not order something and not eat something. So. What's make what makes it hard for us to say no to those things, to resist temptations, to overcome cravings? It's because when we get the feeling. That we want to have the thing or I want to punch the microphone, the act, the consummation of whatever thought that was feels good. Eating the donut in that moment feels really good. The decision, if you're like, oh, do I want it Did it come around? The server comes around with the menus again. Everyone's had their lunch and they're like bringing around the, 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 the menu. And you're like, should I have the cheesecake? Shouldn't I? I shouldn't have the cheesecake. Oh, but oh, Joe in finance is going to have the cheesecake. Oh, Sally's getting a ice cream parfait. What should I do? There's this unpleasant feeling. And the minute you make the decision to have the cheesecake, yeah, I'll take the, um, you know, the chocolate caramel with raspberries on top. Oh, it feels so good. Why does it feel good? It feels good because we have just ended a period of discomfort. The period from when we are triggered to conditioned to want something. And when we decide and that moment we haven't decided we're struggling is a bad feeling, a lousy feeling. Or 
If you're feeling sad about something or upset, so your boss yelled at you, or you're having trouble with domestic disputes, or you're looking at the newspaper and you're seeing headlines that make you furious or, or frustrated or sad or, or disconsolate or, or pessimistic, all those are unpleasant uncomfortable internal states. And the quickest way we've all learned, the quickest, cheapest, easiest, most socially acceptable, most marketed way to make those uncomfortable feelings temporarily seem to go away. They don't go away, do they? Because they pop up so quickly. They haven't gone anywhere. We are just drowning them out. It's like if someone's talking and they're saying things you don't like and you just go and put in your headphones and crank up Spotify. They haven't stopped talking. You're just not going to hear them until you turn down the volume or pull out the earphones. So all those feelings are still there, but we are drowning them out with louder feelings, dopamine hits of pleasure from cheesecake, from donuts, from alcohol, from cigarettes, from porn, from the feeling of being uh, appreciated when you're a workaholic, what, whatever you from gambling, whatever those feelings are that you are trying to not feel. You. Turn to something and that something is almost always unhealthy because that's how our society is set up. That's how our economy is set up. Right. The more we continue to go back to the trough of, of addictive behaviors and substances that don't solve our problem. And the more we need them more frequently and with higher intensity, the better the economy functions. And then, of course, there's the entire economy devoted to dealing with the health set consequences of that behavior, which we call the healthcare system, which is also doing extremely well. So the only people who aren't doing extremely well is everyone else. So that's why I say the key, the secret of well start health is that we don't. Yeah, we, we will give you strategies for making it easier. You know, how can how can you come up with ways to bring your own food to prepare in advance, other simple meals you can make things that are delicious. And that's all useful. And that's all stepping stones. But ultimately, what we are going for, and we go for it starting pretty quickly. So this is something we, we don't spring this on you at the very end. It's not bait and switch. Say from the very beginning that your success in this program and in your life is dependent on your willingness to be uncomfortable. To surf the sensations, the waves of discomfort that you find in your body when a habit loop is triggered and you are trying to decide whether to give into it or not. Or when you feel bad from some other part of your life and you know that reaching for some dopamine producing activity, substance, food, behavior is going to raise your happiness level to the point where it drowns out temporarily for a short time, the unpleasantness. And that is a far more challenging thing than most people recognize. So there's, a, there's an entire branch of psychology called cognitive behavioral psychology that is devoted to helping people see and rethink their dysfunctional thoughts. And so if your if your thoughts are dysfunctional and that's all that's dysfunctional, CBT is tremendously effective. Because you can say, well, you know, um, I feel like, oh, I, I deserve that donut or everyone else is having the donuts or everyone else is having the cheesecake. So I should, too. Like that stuff is pretty easy to dispute if you have the brain space to dispute it. Couple of problems with this. One is when you are in the moment and you are feeling really uncomfortable, our bodies 
don't have a very nuanced discomfort sensors. It's not like multiple systems. We basically have one system that is assessing environmental threat. Are we in danger? Is there a threat to our life and limb, to our ability to survive and reproduce? And if the body thinks that there is, then the body has a program that it runs called stop thinking and get the hell out of there or stop thinking and go attack something. Right. Flight or fight. And the part of the brain that runs that operation. Is not capable of cognitive nuance. And so we can actually get hijacked even by something like an email that makes us feel bad. All right. Our body goes, oh, we feel bad. I'm I'm breathing shallow. I've got butterflies in my stomach. I'm having a stress response. Therefore, the environment must be unsafe. And all of a sudden the brain shuts down the part that can do disputations, the part that can argue convincingly can can win debates. And you're left with this feeling of I am not safe. I'm unsafe here. The second problem with relying on cognitive techniques. Is. That because of the first problem that we can't access them. When you teach someone that their beliefs are dysfunctional. You might think you're doing them a favor, but if they can't give up those beliefs, now you're adding another thought on top of it, which is I'm having dysfunctional beliefs and I still believe them. It's almost like you're telling someone all you have to do to get the million dollars is cross the street. And they are having hallucinations of trucks driving across the highway at 95 miles an hour back and forth. And those are hallucinations. They aren't really there, but they're real to them. And you're like, look, a million dollars just on the other side of this highway. Just walk across. There's nothing here. There's no problem. There's no traffic. And they can't do it. They can't take the step even though they might think, OK, I know intellectually that there's no trucks here. This is just a hallucination. But. People. Can't override their sense of lack of safety. They can't override with thought the deep protective mechanisms that are hardwired into us that have kept us and every other species on the planet alive that senses and moves away from danger. You know, the species that can that can move that, you know, the the stress response to for, for protection, for self protection. So we've got to go somewhere else. We've got to find some other way in that moment. To say no to the thing we don't want to do anymore. And the way we do this at Wellstart is Think of it like weightlifting. Those negative feelings that we're trying so hard not to feel and they can come in the form of the thoughts. Oh, I feel so guilty for what I did. I'm so ashamed of myself. I'm so angry. I'm so frustrated. I'm so disappointed. I'm so aggravated. I'm so confused. All those negative feelings. Or we can go underneath them to physical sensations. What is the physical sensation of shame? Think about something that you did that you are ashamed of and, you know, don't. Don't go to a 10 out of 10, go to a two out of 10, something that was slightly. Yeah, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, a little embarrassing. Ah, yeah, that was a dumb thing to say. And maybe it's far in the past and maybe the person's forgiven you or maybe it wasn't such a big deal. But feel. What happens for me? I can feel like a heat rising here. I can feel like a, a, an emptiness in the pit of my stomach. And if that's the sensation that is unpleasant, that you then interpret as shame, imagine cranking it up to like full blown this you know, terrible shame. I can't believe I did that. And feeling all of that you can feel how much you do want to just want to make that go away. And yet what I tell people is st stay with those sensations the best you can and now compare them to the worst pain you can imagine. If 
like the worst physical pain, whether you, you know, you've had an operation with an anesthesia or terrible dental work or you were in an accident or uh, some some sort of traumatic event and your body was really, really harmed and in pain. Where is your shame? Sensations on that scale from one to 100, if 100 is the worst pain you've ever experienced or could imagine. And for most people, this these terrible sensations, honestly, are about a three out of 100, five out of 100, seven out of 100, it's like this mild stomach ache, a little bit of a headache. And yet, because we short circuit surfing those sensations, feeling them, understanding that we can handle them. It's like the monster under the bed. We never want to look. And so the monster gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If we spend our lives trying to avoid these sensations, trying not to feel them, jumping to behaviors that make them go away for a little while or make them seem like they go away because of the dopamine rush, eating junky food, stuff like that, then we will never explore them enough to realize that we can handle them. They are totally handleable and we can practice handling them in tougher and tougher situations. And so those negative feelings, instead of being the problem, now become like those weights in the gym that we lift heavier and heavier ones and grow ourselves stronger and stronger. So all of those hacks and tricks and avoid this aisle at the supermarket and if it's in your house, it's in your mouth, all that stuff that we're going to try to make it easier for ourselves. Ultimately, we don't need that because we've made ourselves stronger. We've made ourselves better. Right? Uh, I think it was Jim Rohn who said, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. Well, we do both. We make it easier and we make sure we make ourselves better because life is not always going to accommodate with easier. Life's not always going to make it easy for us to avoid junk food. The other thing I'll say is that a lot of people come to Wellstart looking for weight loss. And so the big debate is, of course, you know, food or exercise. And the truth is, exercise has a very limited contribution to weight loss compared to food. Maybe it's 2080. I can't I can't you know, give an exact number, but it's certainly not the significant thing. But we really push people to walk, to move, to engage in physical activity, to stress their bodies. And it's not for calories in, calories out. It's not for weight loss. It's because uncomfortable physical movement is a great analog, a great preparer of for us doing uncomfortable things like saying no to delicious, tempting foods. It's easier at first to to walk, jog an additional 20 yards till we're out of breath, till our feet are hurting, till our lungs are pounding, till we're uncomfortable than it is to say no to our to our favorite vices that we would consume. And so we practice. Vitamin D. We practice discomfort through commission through moving, through doing something right. Dead person can't run 20 yards. Dead person can say no to a donut or can not say yes to a donut. But we're doing the, the positive things, the acts of the uncomfortable acts of commission to practice our vitamin D muscles so that when we need them, we've built them up and we have some confidence and we can make it more automatic. And there's a lot of stuff I'm not talking about here about in that moment when you get high amygdala hijacked by the stress response. Well, you still have to do something different. But we, we there are ways of hardwiring it into you that we get into in depth in the program. So I hope this has been useful for folks. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type them in the comments. I'd like to remind everyone that well start health is still accepting people into our current cohort. You've missed two days, but if you want to jump in, um, really today's kind of the last day that you can do that. Um, if you, you know, join today, you still get the scale, blood pressure cuff, um, and you get the 15 minute 
one on one coaching call with me and, of course, access to our curriculum, to the group calls, to private SMS texting with your coach, to a forum, uh, to dietitian calls, to all of the resources, the recipes, the unrecipes. Um, and I hope, so I hope this helps you see like what we're about, whether you do well start or not. This is the key to change, embracing vitamin D discomfort and using it paradoxically to have a much more happy, comfortable, healthy, joyful, feel good kind of life. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, this is Howard Jacobson, another well-starred well cast, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Take care.